surface number one here, surface number two here, here's a point uh, Q, here's a point P, and you can look at the tangent plane here, and of course the exponential map, so I guess what does the exponential map do? Um, the exponential map goes from the tangent plane um, to the surface. So you say, you say this point is xp of some vector v, where the vector v lives in the tangent plane. But of course, once you choose a basis, once you choose a basis, um, this is now R2. And once you choose a basis, you can actually make the exponential map uh, go from R2, at least some subset of R2, into the manifold. You can say, uh, you can say a point, uh, let's say S1 comma S2, maps to um, exponential at P, S1 E1 plus S2, make the lowercase is consistent, E2, where E1 and E2 are the chosen basis for the tangent plane. Oh, uh, sorry, that should be capital, that should be capital E1, pardon, capital E1, capital E2, because the basis is up here. You could draw it in a different color. So we have uh, E capital E1 here, capital E2 here, and then these map onto the coordinate vectors, little e1 and little e2. Okay. Right, so that's the, the exponential map set up. Now, what can you do? Well, let's suppose we have two of these, right? We have two surfaces. Somehow the idea, um, the idea for mapping from m to n, to building a mapping from m to n, is, well, you take your exponential map, you go here, and then you associate the tangent spaces in, the, in a sort of a canonical, in an obvious way. You say this this e1 e2 goes over this e1 e2, and then you go back. So let's draw a picture here. You have um, your second copy of R2 here, e1 e2, and let's call them e1 hat and e2 hat just for good measure, because we're on a different surface after all. Um, and then here's your capital e1 hat and capital e2 hat, just because we're on a different surface. So the idea, right, the exponential goes like this, right? And this is going to be your standard vector space isomorphism between, you know, between two vectors, between two, between R2 and R2, association. E1 goes to E1, E2 goes to E2. So your full map from, from a piece of M to a piece of M is just X, inverse compose x of uh, q, and this is going to be the, the n version, this is the n, to put a hat on top of it, this is the n version of the exponential map, and this is the m version of the exponential map. So this thing here is a mapping between m and n to build, it, as soon as you can build the exponential map. Does this map make sense? Oh, yeah, right. So, uh, the inverse of exponential of P on surface M will basically take a point on the surface and give you the coordinates as yes. S2. But we do have to take that as one S2 to S1 yes. cap, S2 cap. So, shouldn't there be some composition? Some, uh, some function? Yeah, there should be. That's right. There should be a, let's see, what we, we need to give this guy a name. Let's call this one just I. Yeah, so but yeah. it's not necessarily always identity, right? No, no. I'm saying I for identification as opposed to identity. Because technically speaking, there are two different vector spaces. Yeah, so there will be some function. Yeah, so let's put that in here. This is compose with your I and compose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. That's the important question. Okay, so, so um, Matt's question was, why can you just treat those two R2s as the same? Um, well, okay, so just keep in mind what we're trying to do. We're trying to make two surfaces of constant curvature equal to each other, or you know, locally it's morphic to each other. So, we have to make some choices in doing this. One of those choices is actually P and Q. Which P do you map over to which Q? That's the first choice you have to make. Um, since the curvatures are constant, that choice doesn't really matter. Like you kind of want to, you, you kind of want to send P to a place Q where the curvatures are the same. That's what, that would be sort of the first thing you'd want to do. You'd want to send P to a, suppose the curvature of P is 5 and the curvature of Q 
Well, you choose Q since the curvature is also 5. But since you have a constant curvature, two constant curvature surfaces with the same constant curvature, P and Q can be arbitrary. So you make a choice there already. Now, you make a choice of vector space here and a choice of vector space. Well, you, know, so you make a choice of bases here and a choice of bases there. Well, let's go ahead and choose orthogonal bases in both places. So this we know we can do. This is sort of a canonical choice. I mean, it's a geometric choice. It's a geometric condition to be orthogonal. So you make orthogonal choices. And so what, is, um, what, what you have now is two vectors, two, two, two bases, which are orthogonal, but perhaps misaligned. And so Matt's question is, well, um, how, do you, how do you geometrically choose that last bit of alignment? Well, the answer is you can't. You actually cannot choose. You can't make a geometric choice for that alignment. But you can make an arbitrary choice. So you make an arbitrary choice of identification of this vector space. We're going to call it I. So it's an arbitrary choice. And then you can build this exponential. You can build this sort of cross exponential map that takes you from one to the other. And the price you pay for that arbitrary choice here is there has to be a bit of arbitrariness in the outcome. And the arbitrariness in the outcome is there are many different ways. This, this local isometry construct is unique. That's the price you pay. Um, right. OK, so how does the theorem proceed from here? Well, you still, have to, you still have to do something. You still have to prove that this thing is an isometry. This thing is clearly a diffeomorphism. So it's clearly a differentiable, well-defined way of getting from n to n to n. But it's not necessarily one which preserves the metric. You're just you're hoping this. You just created it. So what you still have to do is prove that this thing is um, an isometry. So that's that part we're not going to talk about because it's a long and involved calculation. But let me just tell you the gist of it. The gist is you write down the equations that this would need to satisfy in order to preserve the metrics. And again, it turns out the system is an overdetermined system of equations. But you have an important consistency criteria, which is that the curvatures are equal. And it turns out that the equality of the curvatures is precisely the integrability condition which allows you to um, re-express the system of differential equations in, in a solvable form. Like you basically re-express them as a, uh, as a system of ordinary differential equations, and then you quote the existence theorem of ordinary differential equations, and then you have your, you have your uh, you pre th therefore prove that these, that these uh, um, well, I guess you use the uniqueness part of the solution to show that the curvature, that the, that the metric coefficients are the same. Okay, so there's some differential equations you have to chase down in order to, to do the last step. But basically the first steps are constructing this, this um, diffeomorphism of making the <coughs> choices. So the basis of points and so on. Okay. So that's the local picture. The local picture is you can always construct something like this, and if you satisfy the integrability conditions, this thing behaves properly on the metric. Um, globally, it's much more complicated. Um, extending this isomorphism <coughs> globally is a, is, a, is a problematic thing. And we won't, get, we won't, we won't talk about global theorems. Oh, I should say, I'm um, sorry, just to give you a bit of intuition, or maybe you already have a situation. What's the surface of constant curvature one? Sphere. Curvature, surface of constant curvature zero, plane and minus one. Yeah, this is somehow not so easy to visualize, but the hyperbolic plane has constant curvature minus one. Um, but there's also this thing called the pseudosphere, which is this sort of extremely long Vuvuzela like, you know anything about software, this sort of trumpet like surface, um, which has Gauss curvature minus one. Constant Gauss curvature minus one. Okay. Um, right, so, uh, but basically, the, the surfaces of constant curvature are very special. Vuvuzela, sphere, and plane. <laughs> okay, um, right, never mind. Next. Okay, so, the uh, last bit here of, of Monday's lecture was the gauss planet theorem. I guess it's so, so super important and um, it's cool. So, I guess we should look at it. I uh, more or less decided against going through the entire proof because it's an entire lecture. But I have, I have a nice sketch, which I hope will 
be satisfying. Okay, well, we've already seen the gauss bonnet theorem more or less in various versions of the course already because it's come up in Justin's lectures. Um, right, so the gauss bonnet theorem, what's so what's about? Well, it shows the curvature is a global invariant, too. So I said it was a local invariant. It has to do with locally making surface size metric. Well, it's a global invariant as well. And it has an important connection with the topology of the surfaces involved. So we'll come to topology at the very end of the statement of the theorem. We'll just read through the theorem for it. Okay, so we're going to say that S is a regular oriented surface with piecewise smooth boundary. So I want you to imagine some kind of surface, well, actually, kind of the surface that I keep drawing, right? It's got these corners at the boundaries, right? So the boundary is smooth, except in a few places where maybe there's a cusp or a sharp bend or something like this. But on the interior, it's smooth. Um, and the boundary curves, let's say we have CI, we have CI plus one, and since we're, a piece, since we're piecewise smooth, I can build um, angles. There's an angle, there's a tangent vector which goes like this, and then the next tangent vector which goes like this, and there's the exterior angle. So the exterior oriented angle, there should have been another word here, oriented, right in there. The exterior oriented angle is the one that goes from CI to, to CI plus one as you follow the tangent vectors around in the correct orientation. Okay, so this is the kind of surface we're going to study. So this is our surface S, and it's got these boundary components. And now the gauss bonnet formula is this one right here. So it's got four things in it. The first is, the, well, let's say the most important, the biggest piece here, this is somewhat hard to first, is the, order, is the, um, pardon me, the uh, integral of the Gauss curvature of the surface. So you integrate k, the Gauss curvature over the surface, you get a number. On the right hand side is the topology part, 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the surface. If you remember the Euler characteristic of the surface, chi equals 2 minus 2g, where g equals the genus of the surface, and the genus of the surface is the number of holes. So for a torus, g equals to 1, for a sphere, g equals to 0, and then you have, well, you have, you have the surface with more holes. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, we did, I, I don't think I mentioned it, I'm not sure if I just mentioned it, but the other characteristic is a topological invariant. What this means, is it's sort of obvious if you connect to the number of holes. Um, you know, no matter how you, how you deform the surface in a, continu in a continuous manner, the number of holes can't change. So the genus counts the number of, the genus is a topological invariant, which is uh, an invariant to, to continuous deformation. The number of holes stays constant. The other characteristic is actually defined in a little bit of a different way. It's defined as the number of, the number of um, vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces for any triangulation of the surface. So it somehow it's remarkable, a remarkable thing, because this after all was discovered first by Euler. The remarkable thing is that that quantity over there is the topological invariant. Like why should the number of vertices, edges, and faces, and so on, have any kind of connection to each other when you deform the surface around? It's somehow obvious that the obvious of course that um, the number of holes doesn't change, but that this quantity is invariant, hmm, maybe that's a bit more surprising. But in any case, this is the Euler characteristic. It's either this special number you derive combinatorially from a triangulation of the surface. In other words, a division of the surface into triangular patches which, with no, you know, with overlap along the edges only, controlled overlap. Or it's this 2 minus 2g where g is the number of holes. And there's a, big, there's a big theorem which goes from here to here. Classification theorem. Okay? Is the limit of the surface of the boundary of the power? Is it the genus? Oh yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, the, um, yeah, the other characteristic of this, uh, of this surface, um, actually, I'm kind of one, actually, I don't remember. Okay, so, yeah, so this, this what I'm describing here, I guess, is the other characteristic of a closed, yeah, this, this result is true for the other characteristic of a closed surface, where, there, where the number of boundary components doesn't matter. 
And actually, I can't remember. I'm sorry, I can't remember this. I can't remember if um, this order characteristic is, is that of the bounding. Do you know of the bounding? Of the service with bounding, including its number of boundary components? Or um, is it the capped off service? It's, it's including the boundary, right? That's why you have that geodesic curvature term? Well, the boundary bit is accounted for here, but is this number, is this 2 minus 2g minus the number of boundary components, or is this 2 minus 2g? Oh, it's uh, including the, the boundary. 2 minus 2g minus the number of boundary components. But I ask if that plus or minus wrong, but I think it's yeah. minus the number of boundary Okay. I can look it up. Really well, quick. I guess we can work it out for a, for, a, for a disk. Okay, so yeah, thanks. I guess that point I'm mistake here. So what I'm describing for you is the, um, the oil characteristic of a closed surface. In other words, the boundary is empty. And then what you need to do is add on or subtract number of boundary components. Actually, I guess it is plus number of boundary components. Yeah, I think that's um, G is still the number of holes. And this is the number of boundary components. In the case of a, in the case of a uh, surface width boundary. Okay. In any case, number of boundary components and holes is a topological invariant. Okay. So come to here. So this is the this is the Gauss curvature piece, and this is the topology piece, and they're connected to each other. There's some extra terms. Well, there's the um, there's a sum of curvature contributions on along each smooth part of the boundary. So you compute the geodesic curvature along each smooth part of the boundary. You add that into the formula. And then it's the, and the final part of the formula is the sum of the, turn, of, the, of, the, uh, of the turning angles. So it's the sum of all the exterior angles as you go around. Okay? So this is your Gauss-Binet formula. Relates the um, geodesic curvature of the curve, the turning angles, the Gauss curvature in the center of the surface to a topological ingredient, topological Logical invariant. So, a very important formula. Um, uh, it is somehow the, the culminating experience in a differential geometry course to a first year differential geometry, like undergraduate differential geometry course on curves and surfaces to prove the Gauss theory. Gauss -Binet theory. And it takes, it takes like three lectures or something like this because there's a lot of different ingredients. Well, here's a sketch of the proof. Hopefully, this will take 10 minutes. Maybe less. <laughs> anyway, um, because I, I owe Justin some material that I'm, I'm probably, yeah, anyway, I'm going to get there. Okay, so um, if you guys want to talk about the Gauss Bonnet theorem, we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, so how does the Gauss Bonnet theorem work? Well, somehow, the first step, the first thing is the whole surface itself is somehow too, uh, too big to deal with. So what you want to do is break it up into small patches. So you break it up into triangular patches. I'm not sorry, I should draw a bit of triangles. You draw, you, you break it up into triangular patches. Okay, what's a triangular patch in this case? Well, it's a curved surface, you can't draw straight lines. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the lines are straight or not. Just draw lines, draw, draw curved. They can be curved, so your triangles can sort of look like this, right? But as long as they have three different curves with three different vertices, you're okay. And furthermore, the overlaps have to be right. So you can't have, you know, this is a, this is a bad overlap. You can't have that. The overlaps have to be right. You either overlap along a full edge at a point only or don't overlap. Okay? So you triangulate your surface. And the idea is going to be to apply a local version of the gauss bonnet theorem in each triangular patch. So each triangular patch, you're going to make it so small that it's got the topology of a disk. So the topology is super simple. You, you've gotten rid of the topological complications. You make the triangles really small. Um, and then you want, to, you want to apply a local Gauss Binet formula inside that triangle. And then you want to add up the results. And hopefully when you add up the results, because of this vertices minus edges plus faces care, um, um, formula, when you add up the results, the, the right hand side is going to sum up to the other characteristics. So that's, that's the way it's going to work. Um, okay, so now the local gauss bonnet theorem itself has a number of steps. Six steps. Now, the first step uh, is a home, was a homework assignment. 
uh, is this introduction of an orthogonal coordinate system. So what you want to do is choose a really simple coordinate system so that you can prove the, Gauss, the local gauss bonnet theorem appropriate uh, problem quickly, sufficiently inside that triangular patch. You choose the best coordinates you can. And it turns out, well, as you'll see in a couple, well, step two actually, um, step two and three, um, the best possible coordinates are orthogonal coordinates. So just to remind you, orthogonal coordinates are where the metric looks like gij equals to, we'll say, g11, so g, the metric, looks like g11 dx, dx1 squared plus g22, so you're not used to this notation. The metric for us has been a matrix, so there, that's what I mean. It's a um, coordinate system in which the off-diagonal element of the matrix is zero. In other words, the coordinate vector fields are orthogonal. They might not have unit length. G11 and G22 aren't one, but they but still are orthogonal. Right, and so you want to choose these triangles so small that they fit inside, um, well, that there exists a orthogonal coordinate system which is bigger than one of those triangles. Okay, so, so what you do is you make a good simplification to start. Okay, so now what you have is your orthogonal coordinate system with the origin here. And let's say you have your, your triangular patch, which looks like this. Here's your triangular patch. And with that loss of generality, we can stick one of the vertices at the edge, which at the origin, but you don't need that. Okay, so why are you in an orthogonal coordinate system? Because you want to rigorously define angle. What is angle? Remember, um, uh, the gauss bonnet theorem is all about, well, involves this term, which, in, which has um, changing angles. So I need, an, I need to define angles properly. To define an angle properly, you need a reference angle. You know, you need some reference line which is straight, and you measure angles off of that line. Okay? So the reference line you choose are these, um, these coordinate lines, right? And so as the tangent vector of the curve moves along, right, you measure the angle, sorry, angle is red, you measure the angle relative to the reference direction. So this is, this is theta at a point S along the curve um, C of S. All right? So you define the angle as you go. Okay, so once you define angles, it turns out there's a really, there's a very nice relationship between um, the derivative of the angle, d theta by ds, and, 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 um, cur and, the, and the curvature. Basically, yeah, anyway, there's a nice relationship between the derivatives of the angle and the curvature. I won't tell you what that relationship is because I want to through. But let me tell you, let me say that there is a nice relationship. The next step in the proof is right here. You relate the derivatives of the angle function to the curvature of the curve. And once you have d by d theta related to curvature, the next thing you do is you put an integral sign on both sides. So on one side, you integrate the Gauss curvature. On the other side, you're integrating the um, tangent uh, angles. And when you integrate the tangent angles, you get theta at the beginning minus theta at the end. Right? And, well, when you, when you add those contributions up as you go around, that's where the, that's where the, the angles are going to come in. Okay, so the integral on the left gives you these change of angles. The integral on the right has got a bunch of different terms in it, but it also includes the an, an object to which you can apply Green's theorem. Remember, Green's theorem says the integral of something along the boundary is equal to the integral of something else, the divergence, on the interior. And it turns out that the quantity you have to you get by applying Green's theorem is precisely the Gauss curvature in the coordinate chart. Again, orthogonal coordinates are important here because 
because you recognize the object that you're integrating as the divergence of something. You see it. So that uh, allows you to apply Green's theorem and invoke uh, well, well, Green's theorem and, uh, and, for, and, and uh, obtain the gas curvature. Okay, so that's more or less how the, that's my sketch, my very brief sketch of the um, gauss theorem. Okay. The angles that you define, those are in parameter space or in free space? They're in parameter space. Yeah. But um, they have, um, yeah, they're in parameter space. Pardon me. Yeah. But they have, a, I guess they have a geometric meaning. Um, yeah, I suppose there is some parameter, yeah, good, I guess good catch. There's some parameter dependence you have to check here. But um, the, the, these, um, yeah, let's say the reference line is the reference line is not geometric, the ten, and but the angle from the reference line to the um, tangent vector is geometric. And you can prove that that is independent of. You can prove that as a nice change of change of parameters. Yeah, yeah ready? Uh, the goal is you can define independent of. I mean, you can change the parameters and you still have the same goal. Yeah. And the angle is dependent upon the goal, right? So in principle, it should not depend upon the goal. Right. I'm just yeah. trying to clear the other. Yeah, no, that's, that's right, that's right. Yeah. But of course you write it down in the representation so you know to make sure all the guys are dotted and T's crossed to check it. Yeah. Okay, so that's my um, that's my sketch of the gas Yeah? Um, is there an extension to the case where you have a whole line where the surface is um, non smooth? Um, so you said that you need to have a finite number of these edges <coughs> or corners. So what if you have a surface where you have a whole line? Where it's non so in other words, like a box or something. Yeah. Yeah, with, an edge, with, a, with a sharp edge. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know. Um, I don't know. My guess is that because you can. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, so my, my, my for the box, the answer is some. It's easier than for a different type of surface. Because you can just un you can like it's sort of locally flat. You can prove that the surface is locally flat. Um, is that also a question? Um, the question is, what if the surface has a has a has a crease in it? Does the Gaussian theorem what version of the Gaussian theorem applies to a crease surface? Uh, the, the same one, right? You, you just do the geodesic curvature along the crease, and then you have to deal with the singularity in a special way. But fortunately for us in this class, we actually know that version a lot better, right? Because it's just the angle dash is it. Uh, well, that's that's if the crease is ex is like the partition the surface of the two pieces. I, I think it's it it just still works out. You just have these isolated singularities, and then you connect them with curves. And at least in that case, uh, life is still good. Uh, <laughs> This is the, the version that I remember proving in my undergrad differential geometry yeah. class. Um, I, I, well, my instinct tells me that there should be some contribution to it. If the, if, the, if the crease itself has curvature, if the crease itself is a straight line or a developable curve or something, then something has to happen. Something feels like something has to happen there. But I don't know what it is. It's a good question. Um, OK, so uh, let me move. So that's the end of Monday's lecture. <laughs> um, so now we're going to move to Wednesday's lecture. Okay, so do our best to get through this. Okay, so um, we're going to move to uh, so what's the title of the lecture? Pardon me, surface deformation. So we've seen now um, rigidity, which is you know how rigid surfaces are and don't like to get deformed because the curvature is an invariant, and in order to deform a surface intrinsically, you have to change the curvature. And we have all these theorems which say that the curvature doesn't want to change. Or it's hard to change curvature. Okay, but well, we all know that objects can deform, and in fact, in computer graphics, you, you see examples of deformed surfaces all the time. So I'd like to give you a bit of the mathematics behind extrinsic changes of the surface. So the outline is well, for me, it's going it's to anchor the lecture. It's the fundamental theorem of surface geometry. And then I'm going to remind you about some terminology, just embeddings and isometries you've seen before, but I want to connect those to deformations. And then I'm going to give you two examples of deformations. Curvature flows, and we'll talk a little bit of the elastic deformations. And Justin will take up um, at least some simplified versions of elastic deformations 
uh, that arise in, uh, have arisen recently in a number of computer graphics papers. Okay, so first thing you need to know are the Gauss and Kadazi equations. So the Gauss and Kadazi equations are these two famous equations that, that you see in different geometry that are maybe this is the first thing to look at here. These are consistency equations. Oh, I kind of forgot to put a. Um, yeah, okay. I forgot to uh, uh, put a little introduction to this slide. Okay, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Um, right, suppose you have a surface. So a surface S. And what we know is that um, there exists a metric, which is the intrinsic part. And there exists a second fundamental form, which is the extrinsic part. Right? And this thing gives you G, and it also gives you the Christoffel symbols, and it also gives you the curvature tensor. And the extrinsic part, well, let's just call it A for now. Put an A for the name. And, oh, okay, fine. It also gives you the mean curvature and the principal curvatures and the principal directions. Right? So it gives you the extrinsic uh, curvature information. Okay. Well, it turns out that there is a key consistency relationship between intrinsic and extrinsic objects. These things have to be consistent. You can't just have any old G paired up with any old A. They have to relate to each other in a nice way. And the relationship are the Gauss and Kudazi equations. The Gauss equation you've seen before. It says that the Riemann curvature tensor is related to the well, to this quantity of, or involving A, which is basically the determinant of A. Okay, you have to get the upstairs and downstairs indices right. But in any case, this is the determinant of A. And the way we got the gauss kadaz equation is we took just a very natural consistency condition of Euclidean space, which is that second partial derivatives of vector fields commute, and projected it normal, I mean normal and tangent to the surface. And what we got from the tangential part was intrinsic and the Riemann curvature, and we, what we got from the normal part was extrinsic and um, second fundamental form stuff. Okay, so this is the Gauss equation, or in other words, Gauss's uh, theory about the Grigio. Okay, well, there's another important consistency equation, and that's called the Cardassi equation. The starting point is the same. It's the, it's the fact that extrinsic exterior R3 partial derivatives of vector field, second partial derivatives of vector field commute. And instead of projecting onto the tangential vector, we project onto the normal vector. And I won't work this through, but basically what you end up with is another link between intrinsic and extrinsic. So this object here, A is the second fundamental form, and del A is the covariant derivative the surface intrinsic covariant derivative of the second fundamental form. So even though um, G isn't, isn't explicitly in here, G is kind of hidden in here, right? Because G makes the covariant derivative, right? So again, it's Christoffel symbols linked up with, with, with A. So this here is another consistency equation. It follows, it must hold, because of this very obvious and very well-known uh, Identity which holds in the Euclidean space. So the, the idea, the idea of the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry is that these consistency equations are enough. They uniquely characterize the surface. So there's exact, in other words, there's exactly one G and A if they satisfy these, which determine the surface more or less completely. So here's the statement of that theorem. I'll let you guys read it, and I'll walk through it. Okay, so what's happening? So this is a local theorem. So I start with an open, simply connected subset of a plane. So in other words, 
what I start with is I start with a, with, a, with a parameter domain. I don't start with a surface. I start with a parameter domain. So here's my parameter domain, omega. Subset of R2. And what I have living on omega are two things. I have, um, I have a symmetric tensor, a symmetric uh, two zero tensor, and I have another, which is positive definite, sorry, and I have another symmetric uh, two zero tensor, which doesn't have to be positive definite. So I have two tensors defined on the parameter space. I don't know at this point that they come from surfaces. I just say that I have these two tensorial objects, two tensors sitting there. And what I would like to do is construct a surface, so construct an embedding of omega onto some surface such that, such that the second fundamental form are the ones that, are, that I've decided on in my parameter domain. So, right, so this is what I'm saying. I've got, I've got these GNA objects, and I want to prove that there exists a mapping which embeds omega into R3, such that the embedding, the second fundamental form, first second fundamental form of the embedding, equal, once you pull them back to the parameter domain, equal GNA. And my theorem says that's true, provided G and that can be done, provided GNA satisfy the gauss kodasi equations. Um, there's one caveat which is that phi is unique up to rigid motions. So in other words, you can put this surface in space, but you can also put this surface, you can also put this surface, etc. And that kind of makes sense, because after all, we would define GNA in the second part of the form, and meant in the first place was as, um, you know, they were, they were invariant to rigid motions to begin with. So we expect that kind of pattern. So the way we interpret this theorem is to say that the metric and second mental, mental form determine the surface completely, at least locally. Globally, it's a bit more complicated, as always. You know, once you make a little surface patch, how do you know once you wrap around that everything is consistent, or how do you know how big the thing grows, or whatever. It's a bit more, it's a bit more tricky to prove um, global theorems, but there exist global theorems as well. Um, right, okay, so my takeaway for the rest of the lecture, so when we talk about deformations, is that if we want to change the surface, if we want to build algorithms for deforming a surface, blah, 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 if we want to change the surface, then we have to work with the second, second fundamental form of metric. In other words, we have to sort of understand what it means to change or what we can accomplish by changing the second fundamental form and the metric. Okay? So that's what deformation is going to be about. It's going to be changing the second fundamental form in a controlled way. Okay, let me just remind you of some terminology. I, 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 you know, so I kind of need, since I'm starting to deform things, I, it's kind of important for me to have a reference object. So let me, let me, let me remind you, or let me put down formally here, that there's a notion of an abstract surface. In differential geometry, your average differential geometry course your cor can start in one of two ways. It can start with defining embeddings, surfaces and embeddings, or it can define surfaces as these abstract objects and then define embeddings later. We chose the first strategy because it's more intuitive and I get to draw these pictures all the time. Um, but it is possible to define a two-dimensional object without reference to any Euclidean space at all. Um, you know, it really leverages the fact that you have coordinate independence and parameter independence, all this stuff. You can really define things, like you can define two-dimensional objects without Euclidean space. Um, think about how to define a tangent space. It's a bit hard, right? The tangent space is a two-dimensional subspace of R3. How do you define a two-dimensional subspace of R3 without R3? But mathematicians, geniuses that they are, at least, we hope, um, have figured out how to do this 100 years ago or so. Okay, anyway, we have this two-dimensional abstract surface out there. So let's call M the abstract surface, and now a mapping from the abstract surface into R3 is an embedding. Um, and it's embedding if it's if your morphism onto its image, and another and also it's globally one-to-one -one as well. So you have no you have no crossing over of the surface. Right? You can you can embed a straight line into space, 
as a diffeomorphism, and it looks like this. Right? It can cross over itself. That's still a local diffeomorphism. That's still a diffeomorphism. It's just that it's relative to the ambient space, it's not globally one to one because of this, uh, this coincidence here. Anyway, don't worry, this is called an inversion. Let's not worry about embedding versus immersions. Let's just say we have this. Okay. So you've more or less seen this definition before because it's kind of our usual definition of a surface. Except it's just a tiny bit more global. Our usual definition of a surface had M being a subset of R2. Now M is this global two-dimensional object, which is not, which is somehow bigger than a, or more, well, it's, it's, a, it's a, a special case of which is an open set in the plane. But basically it's our usual definition of surface. Now, S equals 5M, S is the surface, the embedded surface, then S has the set metric and second fundamental form on it, and these things pull back to M. In this language, isometries are changes of M that don't change this metric. So an isometry is, is a change which operates not in R3, but it operates on the abstract surface. It's a transformation of the abstract surface which leaves its metric alone. Now, these isometries may or may not involve changes of S. Right? One way of producing a change of M is to move S around. For example, you can do a rotation on S. And then you also have some rigid motions. You also have the you also have the, the wobbling of a spherical cap, or the or the this M4 surface which pops inwards, right? Or you have developable surfaces. You can change. You can the, the the internal and the external changes may be decoupled from each other. But in any case, a deformation is a change of S, and we're going to say that a deformation changes both the metric and the second fundamental form. It is possible to have so-called isometric deformations, which just change the second fundamental form and leave the metric unchanged. But those are, of course, as you can imagine, quite rare. The only, well, Justin mentioned the surface already, which satisfies isometric deformations, and that is a sheet of paper. A sheet of paper doesn't, the internal metric doesn't change when you bend it in the way it wants to be bent. But of course, you go from a flat sheet of paper to a curved sheet of paper, you create second fundamental form. So your second fundamental form is changing. So a sheet of paper exhibits isometric deformations, but in general, your average deformation changes both the metric and the second fundamental form. So this is the terminology in mind. Okay, so the, the two examples I'm going to talk about in the remainder of the lecture um, involve controlled ways in which the second fundamental form is made to change, or is allowed to change, or is understood to change, depending on your perspective. The first example, which is, I would say mathematically very sophisticated, I don't, I don't want to say it's simple or anything like that at all, it's a mathematically very sophisticated example, it's just that it somehow seems to be a very obvious idea from the point of um, image analysis and signal processing and computer graphics, because it's related to Laplace and smoothing, as we'll see in a second. But anyway, the control definition of the surface that I want to talk about is called mean curvature flow. And it says that a family of embeddings changes by mean curvature flow if this equation holds. In other words, if the rate of change of the surface is in the direction of the mean curvature vector. So let me draw a picture of that. Here is a 2D slice of a surface. Let's call this a, okay, a surface. Right? It's a surface. It's a surface. But let's say it's, it's, it's viewed edge on. So I can draw a picture of it there. Here's a surface, and then here's, here's the, this is let's say phi zero of the abstract, phi zero of m. And let me draw in a different color. Um, the deformed surface, right? These guys here are S sub t, which is phi t of m, a family of deformed surfaces. And as, as you deform, right, each point, each point on S0, on S, travels along this family of deformations, right? So it generates a curve. So this is P in S, and this curve here is phi T of P. And of course, that phi T of P has a tangent, that, that, that 
curve has a tangent vector. So this is d phi t by dt. Right? And what we would like is that d phi t by dt is always normal to the surface. This is what we're asking for. We're saying that d phi dt is uh, proportional to the normal vector. And the proportionality is exactly the mean curvature. So if the surface is curved inwards, then the surface flows in the direction of that inward curvature. So we're going to say that the d phi by dt vector coincides with the mean curvature vector, which is mean curvature times the normal vector. So this is, this, is a, this is a definition of mean curvature flow. And like I said, we've seen this before because it's really Laplacian smoothing. It's possible to derive this nice formula, which is that the Laplace Beltrami operator of the coefficient functions, the coordinate functions of the surface, is equal to HDNT. So in other words, we have d phi dt equals Laplacian of phi t, which is a not, well, it's, it's not linear because it's, um, because the Laplace operator is the intrinsic Laplace, so it, also, so it involves a geometry of the surface. But basically, it's the nonlinear, it's a nonlinear heat equation. So I want to say that mean curvature flow is a bit like heat flow, except on surfaces. So initially, what it wants to do is dissipate curvature. So this is why you can use it for smoothing. It makes things smoother. It allows curvature to dissipate. And from an analytic point of view, you can prove a short time existence result. And also, you can prove a smoothing result. You can prove that the, let's say, various norms of the derivatives decrease in time for a short time. But of course, it's nonlinear. So at some point, long time existence is in doubt. The smoothing behavior is in doubt. It doesn't persist for long times. And, well, in fact, singularity is developed. This means the solution of that differential equation ceases to exist after a certain amount of time, a finite amount of time. And geometrically, what this means is, you know, the, the surface ceases to be differentiable. You may have seen this if you, if you ran your Laplacian smoothing for long, up on your homework assignment for long enough. Eventually, something uh, chaotic happens to the, uh, to the curve. Oh, by the way, did, some, was, was some, did the person in the class post about the modern art they're creating? Who posted on Piazza that they're creating modern art with their, um, with their, uh, with their uh, deformation uh, project? Was it one of you guys or was it someone in the camera? Anyway, I laughed. Thank you. That was fun. And we'll try to help you out with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the modern art. Um, in any case, you could be hitting a singularity, which is things go wrong in your singularities. Okay, so mean curvature flow in the plane is rather simple. Well, it's not simple actually, but it's simpler to express. So mean curvature flow in the plane is the same setup, except you're dealing with curves. Um, and I guess I've already said this more or less, but let me just say, the equations are parabolic, but they're nonlinear and parabolic. So parabolic means like the heat equation. And you know, it, you know the existence of an exact solution. You know an exact solution. You can, you can just guess an exact solution. And that is, you can figure out what is the mean curvature flow in the plane of a circle. What happens to a circle is it just collapses. It just gets smaller, uniform. It stays a circle and it gets uniformly smaller as time goes on. And eventually it collapses to a point. And when I say collapses to a point, I actually mean a round point. So like if you rescale, it always, you zoom in on the point, it always stays circular. So the, the mean curvature flow of the plane is a nice place to start because there's some very good results that characterize the behavior completely. Namely, you have the gauge Hamilton theorem, which says that convex curves, any convex curve, not just the circle, circle, stay convex as the flow evolves, and they collapse, they, they become rounder as you go down. And then this amazing theorem, the Grayson theorem, shows that any embedded, any embedded curve, no matter how crazy, starts to evolve under mean curvature flow. I'm writing the arrows in which the curve starts to deform itself starts to evolve under mean curvature flow and eventually becomes round and smaller and smaller and then collapses to a point. So just to illustrate that, here's Grayson's theorem. Here's a non-convex curve. What happens first is the curvature vector is pointing out here, and out here, and in here, and in here. So you expect this part of the curve to go out and that part to go in. So initially, the mean curvature flow in a plane looks like this, and then like this, and then like this. 
And of course, now it's starting to get round. As it goes in, it gets rounder and rounder and rounder, and eventually it collapses to a point. And that collapse happens in finite time, I should say. It doesn't take infinity to get to that point. It happens really quickly. So this is what's known as a singularity, because it's a failure of differentiability of the curve, something drastic, in finite time. Um, singularities do form, or more complicated singularities do form in Grayson's theorem when you have non-embedded curves, like this one. This is a non-embedded curve because it has this crossover point. And Grayson's theorem wants to pull these curves in, but of course, what happens is you get a pitching off behavior at this point here. So that the singularity develops and the flow of the solution ceases to exist. So that's Grayson's theorem for it. Singularities and not. Now, of course, the big challenge is what happens on surfaces. Okay. Well, on surfaces, well, we still have a nonlinear parabolic system. We still have an exact solution from around sphere. We have collapsed into a point. And we have the Huskin theorem for convex surfaces. Namely, any convex surface will eventually converge to a round point. So become round and converge to a point in finite time. So you have the analog of this H. Hamilton theorem. But, now the big change happens. Singularities in the mean curvature flow, they're much more, they're much, much more part of the story. And it's very, very tricky. The simplest example of a singular, singularity formation occurs with this dumbbell surface. So imagine you start running mean curvature flow on this dumbbell surface. Well, out here, the spheres come in. Over here, the spheres come in because the curvature is pointed inwards. But now what about in the neck region? In the neck region, you have two curvatures, two principal curvatures. And the mean curvature is their average, or is their sum. So you can have, you can have the case where the neck is already small enough, where the curvature on the, in the neck region is very large, and the curvature in the transverse region is very low. So they can add up to pulling you inward and wanting the neck to pinch off. In the 2D case, in the planar case, this would just move outwards, because there's only one curvature. But in the 2D case, you have these two principal curvatures, which add up together to form uh, an inward pointing direction. So what happens when you run mean curvature flow on this, this neck pinches, the first, before the spheres come in, this neck pinches off to a singularity. And so the solution of the mean curvature flow ceases to exist. Um, there is th this, yeah, okay, so what's the timeline on, this, on these spheres? This was, a, I think, 1984, this Houston theorem. And people knew about the singularity roughly around the same time. And over the past 30 years, people have been working on understanding singularity formulation formation in mean curvature flow. And I think in 2000 and something, Houston and Sinistrari proved a theorem um, which characterizes, to a certain extent, the singularity behavior of a certain type of singularities. And research is still ongoing. So the final the end of the story, how to characterize mean curvature flow in our pre is not quite quite finished yet. Because singularities are so tricky. Okay, so that's my brief run through of uh, mean curvature flow. The basic idea is you're changing the surface by suggesting a sort of controlled change governed by the curvature. Are we ever concerned about Gauss curvature flow? Oh yeah, Gauss curvature flow exists. Um, there's a paper by Ben Andrews uh, on um, using Gauss curvature flow to model the evolution of stones rolling on a beach, being ground down from all sides. Like the pointy parts of the stone get ground down first by the wave action, and the, you know, so the curvature there, with the negative regions of high positive curvature, get ground down first. Uh, so yes, there's Gauss curvature flow. It's more nonlinear because Gauss curvature is a product of the principal curvatures. And so the singularity formation is even trickier. The analysis is even trickier. But there are higher order curvature flows out there. Yeah. OK, so the last topic, which I'm going to spend a little bit of, well, hopefully it won't go too far over. Um, I want to just briefly run through elasticity and set Justin up for his, uh, for his lecture on Wednesday. I mean, on Monday next week. Yeah, hang on, what day is today? Wednesday. Right, Monday next week. Pardon me. Sorry, that should also be erased from the video tape. Um, okay, so how does elasticity theory work? Um, 
Um, elasticity theory tries to understand this deformation in a very careful and technical way based on how it changes the first and second part of the deformance. Like it's really codifying this, really, um, really delving into the details as to what changes, what deformations produce what changes in the, um, in the induced measure and second part of the deformance. So the setup for three-dimensional elasticity is you have a 3D reference object, this is the unstretched object made out of elastic material. And you have a deformation which produces a, a deformed configuration which lives in R3. Technically speaking, the undeformed object lives in R3 as well, but it's better to think about it as an abstract object which is, exists on its own right. And the deformed configurations live in R3. And well, you have Euclidean metric over here, you have Euclidean metric over here, the original metric is Euclidean in the undeformed configuration, and the deformed metric is the pullback of this Euclidean metric to the undeformed, to the configuration, to the undeformed reference configuration. So it's the pullback of the metric under the deformation. And you've seen this object before. It's d phi transpose d phi. And my shorthand notation is phi upper star of the metric. So in, in elasticity theory, you kind of, well, you, you need to keep this deformed configuration in mind because that's somehow where the physics is happening. But you always, you often refer things back to the reference configuration. And so the reference configuration actually carries two metrics in elasticity theory. It carries the original metric and the deformed metric. So the basic principles of elasticity theory are physical principles. So, um, right, so it, what's going on here? So the, uh, right, so physically speaking, the object has a density. And in elasticity theory, you ask that that density remain constant. So no matter how you deform the traject, no matter how you deform the object, the reference density stays constant. Of course, if you squish the object, then the Deformed configuration has a higher density in certain places than in others, but the reference density always stays constant. Okay, so we need a formula for the deformed density. It's rho t up there, which is rho pushed forward under the deformation. So the deformation allows a rho t to be diff to be non-constant. Right. So what you would like to write down is what is a formula? What is the what, what formula does rho t satisfy if rho is supposed to be constant all the time? And that's the conservation of mass formula. It's this formula right here. It's the derivative of the density is the divergence of the density times the deformation gradient, the, the, or a version of the deformation gradient, which is the spatial velocity of the points. Um, okay, so this is a bit, I guess, a bit complicated. Uh, at least it involves a picture. Um, here is m, here is st, here is phi t. Apologize, going in the reverse direction. Um, you, there's a t involved because elasticity also wants to be a dynamic theory, which is you want to apply time varying forces, and as you apply these time varying forces, the deformation changes at every time. Okay, but suppose we have this time varying family of deformations. Let's pick a point over here, pick a point x over here. How do we know how x is moving? Well, the first thing you do is you pull x back to whatever reference point it was over here. Let's call this x0. So we have x equals to phi t of x0. Or in other words, x0 is phi t inverse of x. So that's the very first thing you do, is you figure out where you came from. In order to figure out how fast x is moving, you figure out where you came from. And then you compute the velocity at that point. You, you compute the velocity prescribed by phi t at that point. So the, the speed that this guy is moving is d phi t by dt at that x naught. That's how fast that point is moving under the definition of phi t. Right? Does it make sense you can't plug, that you cannot plug x into this? Does that make sense? The reason you can't plug x, x into it is because, well, phi t has domain over here. 
So you have to go back to where you came from and then plug that at zero in. So really, the spatial velocity, v sub t, is equal to d phi t by dt, composed with phi t inverse. So this is the spatial velocity. So the conservation of mass formula says that as this reference object is changing, you know, as the deformed version of the reference object is changing, then the deformed density must sort of be in sync with the velocity because the original density is constant. So there's conservation of mass. The second physical principle is conservation of momentum. So it's got the similar conservation law formula from d by dt plus a divergence term. In this case, it's not rho which goes here, but rho v, rho times the velocity. Rho v is momentum, right? De rho is density, rho v is momentum. So you have the conservation of momentum. On the left-hand side, you have the conservation term. On the right-hand side, you have rho times b. Sorry, I, didn't, I should have put a little arrow which says what the b's are. The b's are the body forces. They're applied forces to the object. If you apply forces, you produce a change of momentum. So let's say, uh, let me write that just here. B, T equals body force at time T. And the interesting new ingredient that arises in um, elasticity theory is the Cauchy stress tensor. If you were in a system of particles which were completely uncoupled from each other, if there were no elastic forces holding the molecules of material together, this term wouldn't be here. You would just have a sea of particles, and the sea of particles would have a density and a, and, and a momentum, right? And then they would just respond to the, to the, um, to the applied body force. In, in, uh, in fluid mechanics, a term goes here which involves interactions between particles. I think uh, the fluid mechanics people over there will have to go into detail on that one because I'm not, a, I'm not clear on fluid mechanics. But in solid mechanics, what goes here is a Cauchy stress tensor. And what it characterizes, what it tries to explain is the force per unit area on an internal element. So imagine that this, that this surface, right, here's a little Here's an internal surface element, right? As phi t, when you apply phi t, this round blob of elastic material distorts. So that internal surface element becomes something stretched out and twisted, maybe. And, um, right. And so what we have to measure in the conservation of momentum is how much momentum goes into like shearing and pulling apart the elastic the molecules from each other, right? How much, how much momentum is carried by the, uh, uh, sorry, how much change of momentum is carried by the, um, by this infinitesimal plane going through the surface. So it's the force per unit area on an internal surface element. And well, of course, you've got many internal surface elements. So you need to specify which one. It's the one in direction n, right? And so you're summing over all possible all possible uh, directions. Right? So you're taking all possible stresses into account. So those are the, those are two of the three principles that elasticity follows, that elasticity theory comes from. The third one will involve the metric. Metric has the period, right? So the third one involves the uh, let's say the response of the material to this kind of shear, this kind of this kind of um, uh, shearing of its molecules. So what you do is you define the, so there's many of these, there's many, you define the strain tensor. But there are many different kinds of strain tensor depending on your definite, depending on whether you're here, whether you're here, whether you're covariant, contravariant, half covariant, half contravariant, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the dual right Cauchy green strain tensor. That's one of the many strain tensors. But it's the nicest one from our point of view because it's very simple to explain. It's the deformed metric minus the original metric. It's just the change of the metric tensor. That's all elasticity. That's, that's how the metric appears It's in elasticity theory. It's the change of the metric tensor. So our third principle, which governs um, elasticity theory, is the so-called constitutive relationship. 
it says that the elasticity, sorry, the strain tensor is related to the stress tensor. So, so the way you can think of it is you apply stress. What is the response in the geometry of the surface? It's the strain. And what goes in between here are, again, these transformations which take you from different contravariant, covariant, whatever. C is the elasticity tensor. This encodes the material properties, how stretchy the material is, what directions it likes to stress, to stretch in, whether it's compressible, um, expandable, and so on. And this circle here is a tensor operation, so it's like a, like a contraction of a tensor product followed by contraction. So anyway, you take the strain, you multiply it in a tensorial way by this elasticity tensor, and then you apply a Piola transform. Never mind the details. Piola mm -hmm. transform is again a way of going from here to here and doing contravariant, covariant, etc. The upshot is strain and stress are related by the constitutive relation. And if you go back, you see the metric goes here, right? Or in other words, um, phi comes back here. So you have, a, you have phi's in here. In fact, you have d by dt of phi's in here. In fact, you have d squared by dt because v itself is a derivative of phi. So you have second derivatives of phi equals a bunch of spatial derivatives of phi equals a right-hand side which comes back to phi. Right? So together with the constitutive relation, this is it. This is what you have to solve to get phi as the unknown quantity. Without, without, the, without the constitutive relationship, you don't, the equations are not yet fully determined. This is still open. But once you plug the constitutive relationship in here, phi comes back. This is now a closed equation for phi. Okay, so elastic equilibrium. That's where I'm almost done here. A couple more slides. Elastic equilibrium is actually what we tend to be after in computer. Well, I guess in computer graphics you do two things. You either want to deform an object, like a cartoon character deforms from a resting position to a stretched out position. And what you want to do is take him from one equilibrium, which is this one, to another equilibrium, which is certain forces are applied and is held stationary in that equilibrium. I think Justin will talk about that mostly on, the, on next week. Another thing you might want to do, of course, is do elastic simulation. So you want to, like, in a computer, you want to, in silico, you want to throw a rubber ball on a wall and watch it bounce back. Then you wouldn't be talking about equilibrium, you'd be solving the dynamic equations, which I just gave. But anyway, in elastic equilibrium, when you're looking for phi, which is constant in time, it turns out you can do so by looking for um, minimum of an energy function. That's only true under certain physical assumptions. But in any case, um, you look for a minimum of a so-called stored energy function. And this stored energy function, it's very hard to pin this down, actually, in textbooks that I've seen. I don't know this part very well. But in any case, the stored energy function can take on many different forms, depending on the material properties. OK, so that's three-dimensional equilibrium, three-dimensional elasticity. Where do surfaces come in? Well, surfaces come back when you try to study the elasticity properties of thin shells, of thin objects. So what you do is, you have a surface, a reference surface, which you imagine is constructed from a, sorry, a reference object, a reference three-dimensional object, which is constructed from a reference surface in the middle, and the two layers of elastic material, height epsilon on either side. So you have sort of a thin slab, where the center surface is S, and the slab itself is a sort of an epsilon tower, two epsilon height tower above the thin slab. And that gets embedded in the space. So three, uh, th shell theory begins with this kind of an, uh, of an assumption. You say that the full three-dimensional embedding capital phi is equal to a, an embedding of the, of the kind that we know, little phi of the surface, into some curve configuration, followed by sort of a natural, normal, um, a def normal you know, followed by a very natural embedding of a slab above and below the reference surface. So in shell theory, you try to reformulate the 3D elastic equations in terms only of the embedding of the reference surface alone and the surface geometry of the reference surface alone. It turns out it's very tricky to do this. 
because taking the limit of a system of partial differential equations is notoriously difficult, even when the differential equations are easy. But these things are hyperbolic and nonlinear and blah, blah, blah. So coming up with a consistent model of 2D elasticity is actually quite, was quite a big story. And it was only resolved within the past, let's say, 20 years by a group of people, including uh, CLA. Anyway, the starting point for Justin's lecture is going to be the elastic equilibrium of shells, which is we're looking for equilibrium configurations of these shells, which um, which are high, for which the basic material is hyperelastic, and so therefore there's a stored energy function and all that. And it turns out, well, this the so-called Coiter equations. It turns out you can express the stored energy function in the, in the right in the right assumptions on the on the shell and so on. You can express them in this way right here. So the energy, the stored energy, has two parts: a stretching energy and a bending energy. Each of them involves the elasticity tensor, or at least components of the elasticity tensor. And there are coefficients in front of them which determine their relative importance. How, or how rigid is the object stretching? How rigid the bend in? And the object which goes in here, in other case, in a stretching energy, what goes in is the change of surface metric. So it's the intrinsic geometry is measured by the first of those terms. So in ter how resistant is the surface to change of intrinsic geometry, internal stretching? That's the first. Um, energy. The bending energy relates now, quite amazingly, to the difference in the second fundamental forms. The original second fundamental form minus the deformed second fundamental form. So, uh, right, so there's two different types of elastic deformations for surfaces. There's a deformation to the intrinsic geometry and a deformation to the extrinsic geometry. And of course, in your average surface, they're coupled to each other, they're both present. So when a deformation happens, you measure the resistance to the internal stretching and the resistance to the bending. That's the elastic, elastic energy. Right, and of course, to find an elastic equilibrium, you want to find a minimizer of this energy. Okay, so under certain assumptions on the, right, so the last thing I want to say is that under certain assumptions on this, on this um, um, elasticity tensor, namely you want to make sure that the, that the you know, the responses to shear and stress are so on. If they're, if, they're, if they're just right, then actually you can simplify these things even further. You can just get rid of the, this tensor C entirely. And what you're just looking at is a very simple stretching energy, very simple bending energy. It's just the Frobenius norm of the difference of metrics squared and the Frobenius norm of the difference of second fundamental forms squared. Those are the stretching and bending energies. So then Justin on uh, Monday's lecture is going to it's going to show a number of different algorithms that are, that are whose energies come from this uh, this source right here. Okay, so uh, that's it for today's lecture. Thank you.